Hey everyone, welcome to the Super Collider Challenge. I wanted to begin this tutorial video by providing you with an overview of the Super Collider Challenge from a top-down perspective, so that hopefully you'll better understand the project. I'm listing each area here as a table of contents to make it easier to find everything. First, we begin with the startup section. This has been covered already in Eli Fieldstill's tutorial 2, Making Sound. So feel free to review that if you need further information. Second, we have background synths covered in Eli Fieldstill's tutorial 3, Synth and Synth Def. Third, Dictionary of Rhythmic Sounds, which we'll cover here in my tutorial video. Fourth, Patterns, Performance Code. This is the actual piece of music. We'll cover this second in the tutorial video after the dictionary section. Fifth, we have the graphical user interface. I'll give a rough overview of GUI coding in this video, but this is also covered quite thoroughly in Eli Fieldstill's tutorial 14, GUI, for those who are interested in further learning. To properly understand things moving forward, you'll need a basic understanding of a few areas of Super Collider, like basic syntactical practices, booting the server, making basic sounds, creating synths using the synth def class, and creating sound envelopes. Each of these topics are covered in Eli Fieldstill's first four tutorials. So, before going any further, make sure that you have watched and absorbed these four Super Collider tutorial videos. If you've done this, we're ready to move on to part one. We'll come back to this document as we complete the subsequent parts of this tutorial video. But for now, let's open a new document in the file menu and save it as Part 1 Drum Dictionary. Before we begin, I would like to credit Eli Fieldstill with this code for the Drum Dictionary. I felt like it would be a good fit for our intents and purposes, so I decided to use it. Thanks, Eli. Okay, let's build the dictionary for our drum samples. This will allow us to load and access all of the sound files I've provided quickly and efficiently. We'll ultimately use them in our patterns code in part two of this tutorial. We'll need the three file folders I've provided named low, medium, and high containing the wave drum files. And before we go on, let's go ahead and boot the server in this new document so that we can play sound. Okay, so let's save our dictionary to a global variable D. Within this dictionary, we will add three keys pertaining to the three sound folders using the method add. So your logic should look as follows. Now we'll utilize the class pathName, which is expecting a path to the file contained within the parentheses. So let's drag and drop the low folder into this parenthetical area which will automatically fill in our file's path name in quotation marks. After the path name, we'll add the entries method, which will return a list of all the files inside the folder represented by this path. Finally, we'll use the collect method, which is used to create an array of those files. Within the collect method is where we will ultimately load the sounds into a buffer so that they can be read from memory. For this, we create a function using buffer.read, which requires an argument for the server. We'll simply use s, which is the global variable assigned to the server, as you know. Buffer.read also needs the path of the sound file. Here we'll provide an argument sf and add the method full path to pass the full path name to buffer.read. Finally, Close the function with a curly brace. Note each of the semicolons required at the end of the lines. If you're missing these, Super Collider will return an error. Now it's simply just copying and pasting this code for the other folders that need to be loaded contain the mid and high sounds. And add an opening parenthesis before the first line of the dictionary code and a closing parenthesis following the final added folders code. Now test by hitting command return anywhere within the field of code between these parentheses. Okay, so we should now be able to test our drum sounds within this dictionary. Add the variable where the dictionary is stored, D, and the key for the folder path which you wish to test. For some variety, I'll add the choose method to pick between the right and left hand sounds at random. And finally, add the method play followed by a semicolon. Now, 
press shift return to test that the sounds are working. If they are not working, absolutely double check every line of code so that it matches what is here on my screen. You might simply be missing a semicolon. All right, once this is working, let's create a synth def to play the buffers we have read into memory. First, let's add our enclosing parentheses for the code's region. Next, we'll create a global variable called drums and define our synth def. We'll provide drums as our key and begin our function in curly braces. Now I'll use the class playbuff to provide playback of our stored dictionary buffers. Let's provide an argument for buffer. That way, we can dynamically change to other buffers within the dictionary as needed. We'll also provide an argument for amplitude, which we'll be able to take advantage of using patterns in part two of this tutorial. And let's define our standard variable of sig to represent the sound signal. We'll multiply this by our amplitude so that we can change the volume later within our pattern structure. Also, I'll add the method scope to our play buff so that we can visually see what's happening. Out.ar will work for outputting our audio. I'll provide it an array of channel numbers, 0 and 1, and provide the signal to output. Lastly, let's close out our synthdef function and add it to the server. Now simply press command return within the code region to add the synth. To test it, we'll use synth.new with our key drums and we'll provide a key value pair in an array to choose at random the buffer number from the mid sounds in the drum dictionary. Now let's test it. Okay, so everything appears to be working properly. So now let's go ahead and copy all of our dictionary code and we'll paste it into section three of our original Super Collider Challenge document. All right, now that that's finished, we'll go ahead and begin with part two of this tutorial video, Patterns. And the first thing we'll need to do is create a new file. Let's name the file Part 2, Patterns. And we're ready to go. To begin Part 2 of this tutorial, we need to copy our drum dictionary and synth into this new document. Okay, let's construct a pattern to play back our drum synth from part one. The type of pattern I would like to use for this tutorial is called pbind, which generates a sequence of events that can be turned on or off using the message play or stop. I'll begin by declaring a global variable so that we can turn on or off this pattern as needed. Next, we'll code our pbind, which requires a list of key value pairs separated by commas. For clean think, I'll place each pair on subsequent lines. The first pair needed is the instrument's key. This is simply our drums symbol from the synth def we created in part one. Next, we'll create a key pair for dur or the duration of sounds. Now note, this is not one of our original arguments from the drum synth def. This happens to be one of the key arguments which comes standard with pbind, so we'll use it to create rhythms of varying lengths for our drum synth. For now, I'll simply hardwire this to the value of 0 0.25. Next, we'll add our buff argument and tell it to read only from the dictionary's high sounds for now. And finally, let's supply the amp argument to always default to 1. We'll close up our pbind and add the message play, followed by a semicolon. Okay, it works, but it's pretty boring. You may have noticed that the pbind is picking only the first sound file from the folder. This results in the repetitive effect that we're hearing. So, to give this more variation and to choose the other file in alternation, I'll introduce a new object called pseek. PSeq generates a predetermined sequence of events, so let's change the buff parameter 
to a PSeq which will alternate between the first and second sounds in the high sounds folder. The first argument for PSeq is an array of the parameters that should be sequenced, followed by how many iterations to perform this sequence. For our purposes, let's say inf for infinite. I'm following the dictionary folder name with a bracketed number for 0 and 1, representing the first and second sounds in the folder respectively. Now we have the appearance of alternating sounds to give it a more human quality. We can further apply pseq to other key arguments in our p-binds, like the duration for instance. Let's create a pseq that will continuously play the pattern short, short, long. To do this, we'll provide it a value of 0.25 for the two short hits and a value of 0.5 for the long hits, like this. For some added fun, let's create the low, low, high drum voicing from Queen's We Will Rock You. Well, it's almost like Queen's We Will Rock You, but it's way too fast. I don't think this is going to rock anyone. So, we should provide a method of slowing down the tempo of the pattern. For this, we use a key argument called stretch. This is another included key within pbind, and it will allow us to dynamically change the tempo of playback. We'll need to use a bit of arithmetic to decide the proper ratio, so I'll divide 60 seconds by the desired tempo which, according to Queen, is 166 beats per minute. And multiply this by 4, since we are in 4-4 four, four time. This equates to the stretch length of one measure or bar of music at this new tempo. And the p-binds will react accordingly, slowing down our tempo. Now, let's play it again to see if this is closer to what Queen had in mind. Much better. So, we'll keep our stretch function here to change the tempo as needed for various musical styles later, but I'm going to return it to 240, which is where we began by default. Next, let's add a different pattern to the durations argument using some of the other note links as follows. Let's play it. Okay, not too bad, but I would rather the drums be picked at random from all three folders. To do this, I'll use another pattern called PRAND. PRAND will choose at random from any of the items in the array. It should look like this. I'll actually concatenate the three folders together and remove the brackets to create one master folder, like this. You'll notice that I'm using the plus plus syntax. Now each of the sounds from the folders are being played at random, but we could make it even better. I'll change PRAND to PXRAND, which will never duplicate any of the sounds twice in a row, adding to the overall human feel. Okay, so this is much closer. But for the final touch, I'd like to add more variation in the amplitude of each hit to make it sound more like an actual human performer. I'll create a PSeq that corresponds to the pattern above. Alright, our drums are finished. Let's continue forward by creating another p-bind for our blip bass instrument, which I've included in your project.
Before we start, we need to copy our SynthDef code from the main SuperCollider document that I've included for you to use. First, we'll declare a global variable for the base pattern and create our p-bind. Our key symbol for the instrument will be blip base to correspond to the synth def for the base, and the durations will match those of the drum pattern exactly. This means they'll be playing precisely the same rhythm. So, let's just copy them from our drum pattern. Okay, next we'll need to provide the frequency argument for this synth, since it will be playing pitched musical notes which relate to the keyboard or piano. To begin with, I'll hardwire the pitch to a single note to make it easier to understand for now. But I'll be using a method called MIDI CPS, which converts MIDI note numbers to frequency in cycles per second. MIDI is an acronym for Musical Instrument Digital Interface, and it has been a standard for connecting electronic musical instruments with computers since the 1980s. In MIDI speak, the note number 60 refers to the musical note name C4 or middle C on the piano or keyboard. I've provided you with a conversion chart in your materials which shows the relationship between MIDI notes, note names, and frequencies. All credit for this diagram goes to Jay Wolf from the University of New South Wales. For our purposes in this bass synth, we'll begin with a lower MIDI note 36, which is C2 on the piano, and for super collider we'll convert it to cycles per second using MIDI CPS. Additionally, we'd like to be able to update the pitch later as needed, so I'll wrap this note number inside of a new pattern object called PDEFN. This will give us the ability to change the bass's pitch during a performance. It requires a key symbol, so we'll simply call it bass note. Quickly, I'll define the amplitude pattern and an output pattern, which chooses randomly between the right and left channels, so that we can test this instrument with some different bass note values. Okay, it's not bad, but I think we could make the bass sound more interesting by including our argument for the number of harmonics. For this, I'll add a new type of pattern called P-White to choose a number of harmonics between 2 and 8 at random. P-White is essentially a random number generator which should be supplied a low and high value followed by the number of repeats. Let's test it. Lastly, let's play our bass and drums together to see how they sound. In order to do this, we'll need to place both patterns in the same code region to execute simultaneously. Also, we'll need to add a quantization value for the play method at the end of each p-binds code section. This will synchronize the playback of the p-binds to the internal clock so that they begin playing exactly together. Like this.
All right, our base is finished for now. We'll come back to it later once I've built the arpeggiator synth in the next section. For the blip arpeggiator synth, we'll need to copy in our code from the original Super Collider tutorial file. Okay, as we've done before, we'll add our instrument key, blip arp. Next, for the duration, let's use a new pattern called PW Rand. This is a statistically weighted version of P Rand. For PW Rand, we first provide a list of possibilities in an array, then the corresponding percentage chances of those possibilities occurring, and finally, the number of repeats. I'll code these line by line to show the correlation. The first item in the list correlates to the first line of percentage weights, 0 0.20. The second line correlates to the second line in the percentage weights, 0 0.60, and so on. Next, we'll code a pseq for the frequency argument, as we did with the base blip synth pattern. Each of these MIDI note numbers correspond to the three notes of the C major triad, C3, E3, and G3, as you can see on the chart. Then, we'll wrap it in a PDFN again to be able to change the sequence during performance. Finally, I'll quickly code the remainder of the P-bind for our blip synth using similar patterns to the previous instruments. If you haven't already, remember to add your blip amp synth def to the server with command return. It's time to add some other chord possibilities and try to play our bass and arpeggiator synths through a series of music chords. In this case, I've chosen the C major, F major, and G major chords You'll likely want to pause the video once I've finished typing this in to copy it down into your own project. Let's test it. Now let's copy and paste our finished patterns code into the original Super Collider tutorial document. Also, you can delete the two blip synth defs which we copied over into our patterns document.
Okay, so I thought for the start of our GUI section of this tutorial, I would give you the rundown of how to load up everything and begin performing using this, this instrument that I've created for you for the melody. So we're going to boot the server first. Okay, and the way we're gonna do that, server local boot, or of course you could do server uh, s.make GUI, and you could boot the server that way. Whichever way you choose is up to you. Okay, so now my server is green, we're good to go. Okay, so now from this point, uh, I'm gonna need to add my background synth def. So the two synths that are in section two here. So load my first one, so I'm gonna put it inside this parenthetical field. Command return, that gives me my first scope window labeled one here, and you'll see that corresponds to the one here on this window. Okay, and then from here, I'm going to load synth number two, which is my blip based synth. Put that up here, etc. Okay, so now step three, we're going to load our drum dictionary. So we got to go down just a little bit. And this is the very top region of code inside of this parenthetical area, the very first thing you did in part one of the tutorial. So we've added our dictionary. We can see it down here in the post window. It has been added successfully. Don't necessarily need to test it, but we could. Let's go ahead and test it. It's sounding good. Okay, so now from here, we're going to add our drums synth which is going to pull this up and we'll just sort of move this up here about where it would be okay and then our next step so we've added our drum synth we're going to head down to the gui section so this is our new stuff so we can skip past all the patterns for now okay so we're going to skip down to gui and the very first section of code here is the melody synth which I've designed for you. So this is all self-contained ready to go. So we just need to command return to instantiate this. I'll put this up here. Okay, and I want you to notice something when we instantiate the melody synth and the pitch collection array which is in this very next section of code it's actually going to start our synth in the window here. The reason for this is because I'm using an envelope generator and I'm basically using my gate message here to tell me when to actually allow us to hear what we're seeing here. So you're gonna go ahead and see the sound, the waveform here represented with all of its lots of harmonics and so forth, but it's going to, and you can see as I'm moving my mouse up and down, it's changing the waveform. Um, but we're not going to hear anything just yet until we actually instantiate our GUI and um, create sound using our GUI or using our numpad, which we'll get to a little bit later. Uh, but first things first, I want to tell you a little bit about this. I mentioned that it's responding to the mouse Y position. This is a particular class of objects uh, where you can give it a minimum value and a maximum value. And this is going to correspond to uh, the output here. So if I want 50 harmonics and at the very lowest mouse Y value and 200 at the highest, then as I move from the top of my screen down to the bottom of my laptop screen, I'm going to essentially change the richness of the sound that I'm getting, the resulting sound. So the next thing uh, that I've mapped mouse Y to uh, is the amplitude. So it's also not only going to affect the richness of the sound, but it's also going to affect the overall volume of my melody synth, okay? So that being said, let's go ahead and since we've instantiated our melody synth, we are ready to load the main GUI code region. And that is found down here. 
for right now, ignore the window.closeAll. This is going to close everything, all of these different scope objects that I have here. It's going to close it all. So I don't want to do that. I'm only going to use this as an emergency if I need to close, you know, 20 windows that I've had opened up by reinstantiating sense over and over or the GUI code, etc. Okay. Right now, I'm going to put my mouse cursor inside of the parenthetical area. This goes all the way from here at about line 289 and where I'm seeing it in my IDE and goes all the way down to 472. So this is my entire region here. So don't be intimidated by this. We're not going to deal with it a whole lot. I did give you some judicious choices of how to alter this as a part of your assignment, but this is not the main thing that we're concerned with. From here, it's going to be essentially command return, and I've instantiated my GUI window here. Okay, so we've got our GUI window up. If I were to press one of these buttons here, I'm going to get my melody synth performing for me. Okay, so I have nine notes, nine music notes of a C major scale. So the bottom most note, one here is a C, and then if I step up seven notes and then repeat the octave up here, that's my high C. C and then C. And then this would be a D above. I just wanted to keep with the nice sort of numpad setup that I have right here. The other thing I want you to notice about this is, speaking of numpad, this is actually connected and mapped to the number pad on my laptop keyboard. So if, and I actually have one that's USB, you may not have an external numpad keyboard, you may not have a numpad. If that's the case, you certainly don't have to use these number keys, but I think it makes it a little more performative. As I press these, I'm essentially triggering each of these number pads, but it, you're not seeing anything here on screen. Okay, but what you are seeing is we're seeing in the post window the result of what's happening when I match particular cases. So if in this first case, I'm getting key code equal to 83, that's representing the bottom left hand most number pad number. Um, that's representing its ASCII code here. Uh, that's going to give me this result here. It's going to show me that yes, it is number pad one and it's ASCII code 83. If I press number two on my numpad, then it's showing me yes, I'm pressing number two and it's ASCII code 84. Okay, so that's pretty powerful to be able to use. The only stipulation is you must have this window selected as the topmost window. So it just needs to be on top and highlighted. At this point, my super collider document is highlighted, but my GUI is no longer highlighted. If I try to press my numpad, I get nothing. Okay, so this must be the topmost window, and now my number pad system will work. Okay, so knowing this and knowing how the system works, you can actually remap these. If you don't have the numpad on your current uh, ASCII keyboard or QWERTY keyboard that you're using, you could remap these. Um, let's imagine that we wanted to make it one through nine up on the upper row, starting with one where you have the exclamation point. This is ASCII code 18. We're not hearing any sound because that particular number number one on my QWERTY keyboard is not mapped to anything, but I could map it here. I could replace this 83 with 18, replace 84 with 19, that's gonna give me number two, replace 85 with 20, that's gonna give me number three, etc., etc. And then I have to repeat the process down here uh, for when the keys come up and it turns my note off. 
So my key down actions are all here. This is where I'm turning my melody gate parameter to a one, which is going to give me my sound, as I mentioned earlier. And I have the gate parameter to turn it to zero. When I lift, do my key up action with one of my number pad keys, okay? So if you have questions about this particular area of code, I'll be glad to answer them. You can contact me through email if necessary. Um, but it should be pretty intuitive, hopefully at this point, just understanding that these are merely mapped and that they can be changed. And all you have to do to change them is select the GUI as your topmost window and then start pressing keys on your ASCII keyboard. If I press the letter A, this is what I get, and it is ASCII key zero. The letter A corresponds to zero. All right, so let's move on along. And oh, before we do that, before we move any further, I do want to demonstrate why I mapped it to the number pad. The reason being is if I'm using my mouse to control the number of harmonics and the amplitude, in this particular synth tone, I don't want to have to press buttons simultaneously. I want to use my mouse as a controller, as an interactive controller, and so I mapped everything to these number pad keys on my QWERTY keyboard, so that way I would have independence between my right and left hand. I could operate my mouse with one hand and operate the keys with the other, and it's more like a musical instrument, okay? So, if I'm at the top of the screen and I press 1, I get fewer harmonics. And as I move my mouse further down the screen, it's going to get louder and louder and louder, etc. Okay. Okay. So, you get the idea. Essentially, a method of creating more richness and more brightness using the mouse and more volume, and being able to control the number pad with my opposite hand to control the pitches that I'm playing. Now, beneath this, you're going to see some other code. I wouldn't worry too terribly much about this other than flow layout is how we get all of these buttons to lay themselves out exactly the same distance apart. I have two flow layouts that are happening. One flow layout tells me within this entire window where to put this sort of pink colored box and where to put this sort of uh, dark bluish colored box and how far away to put them. So this is telling me 30 pixels by 30 pixels is where we start from this upper corner right here. And then from here, 100 pixels over and still 30 pixels down, I'm going to put this dark blue area. So that's where this comes in. Okay, so just a quick and sort of rough description of what this does, but you can mess with these values and it will change the positioning of these containers which contain the buttons. So flow layout, if you're interested in a little bit more GUI coding, is a pretty powerful tool at very quickly establishing boundaries inside of your GUI and not having to pixel hunt, so to speak, uh, to place objects on your GUI itself, okay? Now, the rest of this code is simply defining the nature of each of these buttons. Right now, I have 12 of these. Here are my declarations for the variables here, the global variables, and you can see they go all the way through 12. Now, I've left space to where you could add a 13th right here, and this would be chord 4. So if you wanted to add chord 4 into this infrastructure and sort of copy the same idea uh, that you have from here, this would be a method of doing that. And it would just need to fall within this closing parenthesis because this is where my code region for the GUI ends right at the end of this file, okay? All right, so I know that's a lot. Just realize that you don't have to do very much in the way of GUI coding. I just wanted to give you sort of a rundown of how this works 
and how this all sort of comes together, okay? Now, now that we've got everything loaded, why don't we do a quick performance, okay? So we're gonna head back over to the performing section right here. The first thing I need to do is I need to start the P-binds for the play drums and play blip bass. Now that's gonna be up here in my patterns area, okay? And in fact, we don't really need this play drums anymore. It's sort of superfluous because now I wanna start this with my play blip bass as we did earlier, okay? All right, so here we go. So we've got those two things started, two patterns are going. The next thing to come would be play blip arp. So I need to start my P-bind here. Okay. And then I could potentially go ahead and start performing melody if I would like to. So I'm going to go ahead. Switch chords. So we'll say that's the end of my performance. And then from here, I've used my chord buttons. And to end the performance, I just simply need to find my blip arp stop. So I'll stop my arpeggiator first. Then how about I just leave the drums alone? Okay, so that was a sort of quick and rough performance uh, through this interface using all the tools that we've put together. But I hope you're seeing some of the power that you can have with Super Collider, and it doesn't have to sound anything like this piece. It could sound like a totally different style. You could create a totally different performance engine that you could use for EDM performance, um, live music, sort of DJing style performances, interactive performances, um, sound installations. There are all sorts of applications for Super Collider where you can create sound in real time or have others participate in the action of making that sound. So it's been a pleasure and let me know if you have any questions about the tutorial and I'll be glad to fill them via email. And I look forward to hearing from you about your experience with this. Thanks a bunch.